Can Bartholomew, our lone wolf rock star from the last video, persevere through Act 2 on the hardest difficulty? Full will continuing his tour and avoiding getting caught up in the antics of the locals? Well, we've got one way to find out. Before that, if you need a refresher on the rules or missed part 1, go check it out here. Our musical maestro enters the shadow cursed lands at last, and before we go any further we make sure our light cantrip is active since the darkness in this place will damage us if we don't have a light source. And now that we're a bit more prepared, we wander towards the direction of what could possibly be conceived as a path where we come across some harpers wandering through the darkness, who upon seeing us are so starstruck that they just stare at us like a Kingdom Hearts character for 20 uninterrupted seconds. Seriously, I timed it. Before one of them gets sent off into the darkness to go get ambushed, and just like that our first fight breaks out. This fight does not go off to a good start, with all three shadows that go before us lunging at us and landing quite a few blows, one of which is a strength drain, which as the name suggests, lowers our strength by three, causing us to become encumbered and if it gets to zero, we instantly die. Although our HP is the more pressing matter. After sending a bunch of equipment back to the camp to become unencumbered, we use Misty Step to teleport to the middle of our gang, hoping these folks won't mind dying for us, and we heal up by throwing a potion at our feet as well. The round passes by pretty uneventfully and we get the opportunity on our next turn to introduce the shadows to our favorite hit single, Cloud of Daggers, to start shredding away at them. Unfortunately, the first one that goes out of the group manages to break our concentration, so the other two can escape safely, and one of the Harpers falls a moment later. When it gets back to Bartholomew, things are feeling decently dire, so we use a defensive flourish to finish off one of the shadows and boost our AC, before healing ourselves up some more thanks to our Bloodlust Elixir. Another round goes by with all the NPCs beating each other up, and we manage to get an opportunity attack to finish off the undead Harper. On our turn, we use a couple slashing flourishes to take out some more of the shadows, one after another, and things are looking much better. Though another one of our Harper allies dies a moment later. We then use Hunter's Mark on one shadow and a slashing flourish to hit the other two since concentrating on a spell increases our damage thanks to our strange conduit ring. But unfortunately it's not enough and both shadows live with a sliver of HP so we run behind our meat shield, I mean our Harper pal. And just like that another one bites the dust a moment later. Thankfully we manage to get a shot off on one of the shadows which finishes it off and triggers the elixir of bloodlust into a cloud of daggers on the remaining two which gets rid of one right away and gets the next one right as it starts its turn. Honestly a way scarier fight than it had any right to be and if it weren't for the groupies and all the buffs we had carry over from the last act we definitely would have got god. A scary precedent to start off act 2 to say the least. With that out of the way, we carry on to the last light in where we meet the rest of the Harpers who feel very murdery towards us. But thankfully, one of our fans speaks up on our behalf and tells Jahira, the leader here, that it would be a crime to stop our tour. She acquiesces and we get free roam of the inn's grounds, where we get a bunch of power-ups. Our first two are found from Quartermaster Tally, the Cloak of Protection and the Yuan T Scale Mail. The Cloak of Protection grants us plus one to our armor class and saving throws. Not the most interesting effect, but boy is it good. And the Yuan T Scale Mail is medium armor with a base AC of 15, and it allows us to add our full dexterity modifier, which basically makes it 20 AC. And to boot, it also gives us a plus one to our initiative rolls, all around a solid upgrade. Then we meander our way to the best shopkeep, Damon, in order to turn in some infernal iron so he can make us some flawed Helldusk gloves and so we can buy the thorn blade from him. The flawed Helldusk gloves, for all intents and purposes, grant us an extra 1d4 fire damage and a plus one to our strength saving throws as well, for another nice boost to our damage. Well, the Thorn Blade is a plus one scimitar that lets us cast Ensnaring Strike once per long rest, and more importantly, when concentrating on a spell, we grant an extra 1d4 poison damage to all our melee attacks, for yet another boost to our damage. Needless to say, this was quite the good shopping trip for us. Before we leave the inn, we have a quick chat with Jahira who mentions they want us to go infiltrate the enemy HQ and see what's up, and before we go we should chat with Isabel upstairs, who's safe and secure and nothing bad will happen if we go talk to her. Either way, we put that off for later. Now that we're all kitted up, we start heading out of the inn and as it turns out, one of our fans has set up an ambush on some cult members who keep interfering with our work. So we follow them to the ambush site and get in position. Whereupon we meet a drider with a special lantern that keeps the shadow curse at bay, leading a pack of cultists. And just because we can, we convince the drider to give us the lantern, which he isn't too happy about because it means he'll die terribly. And then we launch the ambush anyways, so we can test out our new and improved gear. The fight kicks off and we fire a wicked slashing flourish, taking out one of the goons and seriously messing up another. Then we go down and whack another dude with our bonus action for an offhand swing. 
One of our buddies gets a nice firebolt to finish off the cultist we weakened as well. Though the enemies ain't just sitting by. The one we were fighting rages and reckless attacks and gets a nasty crit hit off on us, taking out a bunch of our HP, and the drider also gets a crit to kill one of our allies before jumping to us. Seeing that we're a bit surrounded, we misty step up to the roof and fire down another slashing flourish to kill one of the dudes and soften up another just enough for everyone's favorite firebolt cast and homie to finish him off. When it gets back to us, we cast a cloud of daggers on both the barbarian crony and the drider to continue damaging them, but they both run out soon after and before you know it, the drider is right on top of us. Bartholomew goes for the thunder wave to try and fling the arachnid adversary off the edge, but unfortunately he makes the save. This lady does manage to shove him though, which is honestly kind of incredible. And then she dies terribly, but still impressive. Really wanting to get this drider away from us, we go for a mobile flourish in the hopes it knocks him off the roof, but he's a stubborn old fellow and refuses to go anywhere. He does in return get a mean multi-attack on us, dealing a ton of damage and breaking our concentration, which as you remember means we do much less damage on our attacks as well. We go for the Hail Mary mobile flourish, which unfortunately misses, and a moment later our last remaining groupie goes down to the barbarian, which really puts us in a tight spot. Another signature cloud of daggers gets upcasted to a level 3 spell slot on Bartholomew's turn and this is enough to finish off the Barbarian and deal some hefty damage to the Drider, who unleashes a multi-attack which thankfully all misses. Then we miss yet another mobile flourish and get whacked with a crit on top of another blow, which brings us down to a measly 2 HP. And right when all seems lost, the mobile flourish finally lands with a crit of our own and sends the Drider flying down taking Good lord, 71 points of fallen damage. This guy's gotta go on a diet. But the fight's not done yet. Though it's nothing an upcasted cloud of daggers can't fix. See you later, nerd. Oh, all in a day's work, you know? Oh my god, what? Okay, oh my god, fight's not over. Uh, what do we do? Let's go with another mobile flourish, which thankfully hits now that the drider has way less AC since it's undead, dealing another big chunk of damage. It then spends its turn running into our cloud of daggers where it promptly dies, hopefully for good, at the start of its turn. Good lord. Now that our heart attack is over, we set about looting the Moon Lantern, which is running on a living pixie who we set free and she is such a big Bartholomew fan that she grants us a bell that protects us from the shadow curse. A moment later we meander across the bridge towards Moonrise Towers and we hit level 6. Level 6 grants us a pretty hefty power spike. We get Counter Charm, which is a pretty lackluster ability that grants us advantage on Charmed and Frightened effects for a few turns at the cost of an action. And more importantly, we get Extra Attack as a subclass feature, granting us an additional attack each time we take the attack action, doubling our weapon-based damage output. To top it off, we get another spell learned, Shatter, alongside a new 3rd level spell slot, and we also replace Featherfall for Knock, since we have Featherfall scrolls and potions, and Knock is a nice occasional utility spell. Before we head to Moonrise, we want to make our way to the Mason's Guild, and as we're in the middle of heading there, we get jumped by a bunch of hooligans hanging out in the town square. This really isn't the most interesting fight as they're all pretty generic goons, but that makes it all the more embarrassing when we eventually get our butts kicked by them, granting us our first death in this act. Yikes. Next time though, we just sneak around and arrive at the Mason's Guild basement, no problem. Once inside, we get into another rather uninteresting fight with some resident shadows. This really isn't the most challenging fight either, so it's nothing a few good sword swings can't fix. Our reward for our troubles is the Helmet of Arcane Acuity, yet another insane item power-up for our build. This helmet makes it so whenever we deal damage with any weapon, we get two turns of Arcane Acuity, capped out at 7, and for each turn remaining we have a plus 1 to our spell attack rolls and spell save DCs, which means if we stay on top of this we basically just got a plus 7 to both, which is just so absolutely insane. And as a treat, it also gives plus one to dexterity saves. This little fella's sticking with us for a while. Now that we're all juiced up, we feel more comfortable heading into Moonrise Towers, where we meet Cethric Thorm, the head honcho around these parts, who seems to be just a wee bit immortal. Which might be a problem. Thankfully, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, he doesn't seem to recognize us, and so we manage to infiltrate without being spotted, even if it is hard not to proclaim to the world who we are. After all that drama in the center room, we head upstairs and meet Zarel, and she begins to suspect us, so we distract her with our natural charm, which works like a, well, like a charm. 
She also lets us know that Balthazar, a lead member of Catherick's Mary Band, is on some super secret mission in the mausoleum to the north and needs some help. With that, we've got a goal in mind, but before we get around to heading there, we've got some side questing to do. First on our list of side quests is talking to the master of the Toll House, Garen Goth Thorm, who really hopes we've got a new album for her. Unfortunately, she seems to want our record to go gold before she'll let us pass. We do our best to confuse her with a lie, but she sees right through it and a fight breaks out. As it turns out, she does more damage the more gold we have, and we find that one out the hard way, dying in a matter of moments thanks to our success. After doing our best DJ Khaled impression, we start attempt 2 in much the same way since I forgot to put the gold away beforehand. So we take a quick break to do some inventory management, cause who doesn't like doing that in the middle of fights? We heal up a bit and fire a few shots off at one of the visages that act as Jerry's goons. We manage to take it out, and when we do, the big G also loses a ton of HP, which means if we take out just the little guys, the big guy goes down too. On our next turn, we misty step to the roof and heal up using our potions so we don't insta-die to the next hit. The enemies get their turns, and all the visages have this little AoE that does guaranteed damage, which chips us down quite a bit, especially when Garen Gothorm comes in with a big hit too. Feeling a little overwhelmed, we down a potion of invisibility and scamper into the darkness. In a cool way, though. And the enemies quickly lose track of us, which breaks initiative. Bartholomew starts the fight back up with a cloud of daggers in a spot that will hopefully hit a bunch of the little guys, but Jerry doesn't take too kindly to that. Our turn is next, though, and we use a couple of slashing flourishes to weaken enemies for our cloud of daggers to take them out, which it does do for one of them, since they're all surprised and just standing in place. Then we drop the banger of a lifetime by thunderwaving the big boss off our roof, dealing a truly absurd amount of damage and taking her out of the fight for the foreseeable future. After that, it's just down to picking off the remaining visages, which go down without a contest one by one. And then we end it with a sick shot through the roof on Garen Goth herself, granting us a bunch of XP and a bajillion gold. As an extra reward, we make a quick little pit stop in the center of town to get us some revenge on those hooligans from earlier, and it goes way better this time. We don't even die a little bit. Side quest numero two has us going to the House of Healing where we find yet another Thorm, this time going by the name Malice. Which, I mean, Dr. Malice, really? Anyways, Dr. Malice is demonstrating on a living person how to use a scalpel to all the nurses who he's teaching, which is, um, I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to show this. Naturally, he's a bit much for Bartholomew, and seeing as how the last Thorm was very murdery, we decide to get ahead of it this time by convincing him to get under the scalpel, to which he is surprisingly receptive. Ooh, I get the feeling our hero's next album is gonna be a little messed up. To wash away the woes and dark thoughts, we head to the local tavern where we meet Thisabald Thorm. These guys are everywhere. Who pours us a drink and offers a toast. Now, I like the occasional drink as much as the next guy, but this is a little much. We do our best to fake drink in it, but the bartender catches us in the act, and our rock star gets into a good old-fashioned bar fight. Much to our chagrin, Thizabald is immune to all physical damage, and he has a boatload of HP. The only way to remove his immunities is to deal elemental damage to him and get him to throw up on you for a ton of damage. Not ideal. So a plan starts to form. We make sure he keeps his distance while we deal with all the other bar patrons and start heading outside. Once that's done, a misty step onto the roof takes us to relative safety, assuming our positioning isn't terrible. And phase two begins. Phase two consists of dropping a gnarly cloud kill using a scroll on the bloated bartender and then spending years repositioning and moving it on top of him every turn to very, very, very slowly whittle him down. He does vomit on us through the floor at one point, which is kind of baloney if you ask me, but it does mean if he does that one more time, he'll black out for a turn. Either way, we keep up the cloud kill plan. Until eventually, when he gets decently low, we intentionally move to the edge to get within vomiting range where he does just as we hope and knocks himself out, leaving us an opportunity to continue our extermination of the Thorm family line. Since getting drunk didn't work out, we settle for moving on with our lives and heading to the mausoleum, where we encounter the literal devil who still refuses to make a deal with us, but does warn us about another devil lurking inside. Mayhaps if we kill said devil, Raphael will finally make a deal with us and will become famous. Even more famous. So we eagerly jaunt inside. Once in the Thor mausoleum, we solve a puzzle real quick, head down an elevator, and solve another puzzle. Then, we take a side passageway leading us to a cloaker, who lets us take out half its HP before it actually decides maybe it doesn't want to get put down without a fight, but by then, it's too late. 
When we get inside the next room, we meet some undead being puppeted by Balthazar, who's a bit of a potty mouth, but understandably so since we're getting ambushed by Shar's groupies. This fight's got a bit of a gimmick, with these Umbral Tremors spawning enemies each round unless we take them out, but since we took the side passageway, there's some more of Balthazar's goons that reinforce us from the main hall. Even though we do a decent job of taking out the Umbral Tremors at first, it very quickly gets out of control for us. And the enemies eventually get the best of us. So this time we prep with the protection from evil and good to make things a bit trickier for them. On our first turn we get rid of one of the Umbral Tremors, then down an elixir of bloodlust with the goal of taking out as many as possible on this turn. Then another slashing flourish to take out two more and we learn the hard way that they count as objects and as such don't trigger elixir of bloodlust. But honestly, this fight is a bit of a wash. We take out Tremor after Tremor before most of them can spawn any enemies, and we actually end the fight with some Skelegoons still remaining on our side. When the fight ends, we're immediately greeted by Flesh, Balthazar's baby brother, as well as Balthazar himself, who we convince to lend Flesh to us for the rest of the dungeon. As we explore some more, we also find Least Expected, a plus two short bow with the ability to fire a blinding shot, and this bad boy is a surprise tool that will help us later, so keep it in mind. More importantly, we find a kitty, who we follow to a big old pile of bones, and it's here we meet Yurgir, the devil Raphael warned us about, and sure as shoot, Yurgir can smell Raphael on us too. Thankfully, this man recognizes stardom, and wanting to impress us, belts out his own song he's working on. But it's definitely not the best. We tell him the only way he's coming back from that is if he kills everyone who heard it and starts fresh, so he gets rid of his cronies and unfortunately Nessa too. We try our best to convince him to take himself out since his singing is an affront to the concept of music and we want to impress Rafi, but he doesn't buy that one and a fight breaks out. And he starts off by landing a couple of hits on us, one of which is a crit, and then just turning invisible. So on our turn, we steal a play from his book and go invisible ourselves with a potion. A couple turns later, we spot him thanks to the invisible seeing eye we have and break our invisibility with a pair of slashing flourishes dealing some chunky damage. Bartholomew slices and dices in melee now that we're healed up a bit thanks to potions, but Yurgir quickly makes us regret that with some heavy hits fired in return rocking our half-work feature and dropping us to 1 HP. The emergency sirens are going off, so we ring the bell to summon Flesh, which we really should have done earlier, and Misty step out of dodge before firing up the healing potion Yeaton Machine. Yurgir does some hijinks on his turn and goes invisible, so on our turn, in order to find him, we do this neat little trick where you can use your movement line in order to find a spot you can't move to, and that's where the invisible fella is. You still have to actually hit him though. Flesh and our diabolic detractor keep duking it out and we keep missing, so eventually we decide to just whip out old Reliable to guaranteed hit him. And oh my god, I, I guess our words did get through to your gear. Well, with that dealt with, we grab the Umbral Gem he was protecting and move on. To get the other three Umbral Gems that we need, it's just a quick jaunt through some trials. The first of them is the Soft Step Trial. All we need to do is to get to the gem without being spotted by the Roaming Shadows. So we start up the trial, do a bit of sneaking, misty step close to the end, and lockpick the final door. Then we grab the gem easy peasy and get out of there. Our next trial is the self same trial, and for this one all we need to do is defeat the enemy that has been sabotaging Bartholomew the most, himself. Thankfully he's a pushover and goes down easy for another umbral gem acquired. The last trial is the faith leap trial, a dark room with an invisible path to the other side. The answer of how to navigate this is on the floor at the start of the room, but who needs that when you've got a potion of glorious faulting and the jump button. Before we continue on, we still have the problem of dealing with Balthazar and his band of undead, and before we deal with Balthazar, we have the problem of dealing with flesh. To solve that problem, we head down to this pit of skulls and summon a rat who is secretly a small piece of a man who was split into many rats. We start a fight, kill the initial rat, and summon a horde of others in the process. We make sure to summon flesh as well and get out of the way for the rats to have a field day on him. The only rats we have to worry about during this fight are these pink ones who explode when they die and put everyone around them to sleep. And sooner than you can say, dear god, that's a lot of rats, have I thought this through, flesh is down for the count. Eventually, the rats are all dealt with and the justicier man who is turned into them reappears and is ready to throw hands. But boy howdy does he really throw hands. He puts us to sleep, seemingly just a style on us, and then one shots us with a blight. The encore goes much the same way while we wait for flesh to die which he eventually does do, it just takes a while. 
a long while. The main difference is afterwards, we stay posted behind a cloud of daggers and fire shots at rats from behind it. That way, if they get too close, they'll just die to the cloud. It works better than we can ever hope since the last rat runs into the cloud of daggers, which causes the rat man himself to spawn there in rat form and also instantly die before he becomes a man again, saving us quite a headache. The classics are classics for a reason, what can I say? Now that baby brother's out of the way, it's time to get rid of Balthazar. Though he's got this funky little habit of drinking a potion of speed to rumble you instantly, so before the fight we make sure to pickpocket it away from him. Once we're in position, we get the drop on them by firing a slashing flourish at Balthy, triggering a fight and surprising all the ghoulish goons in the process. He does get to go first and lands a ray of sickness, dealing a bit of damage, but on our next turn we fire off an insane machine gun of shots downing the stolen speed pod in the process to add insult to injury. On Balthazar's turn, a very scary cloud kill gets dropped on our heads, taking us frighteningly low. And we retaliate by breaking his concentration the old-fashioned way. R.I.P. Bozo. After that, we just clean up the remaining ghouls, and with some smart thinking, they don't pose a threat, and go down real easy. Before we get to freeing any immortal beings from their eternal prison and starting the world's greatest battle of the bands, we do a little bit of sabotage on some of the denizens of Moonrise to thin out their forces. And a buff we really can't ignore is the one we get from talking to Isabel, who is safe and sound on her balcony in the last light in. So Bartholomew goes to have a calm and normal chat with her to get that sweet, sweet necrotic resistance. As a fun little side note, this girl is Thisabold's sister. Can't you see the family resemblance? Anyways, we have a lovely chat with her and nothing bad happens at all and oh my god, it's Flaming Fist Marcus coming to kidnap Isabel. Oh no, Isabel's got paralyzed by one of his demonic goons. Oh no again, Isabel got kidnapped by one of his demonic goons. Well, nothing like a second attempt to really get the blood flowing. And she got captured again. Having learned from our mistakes in the previous two attempts, Bartholomew is more than ready come attempt 3. With a precasted guidance to activate our concentration based items and a bloodless elixir in hand, we kill one of the flaming fists' fiendish foes. Then we try using a gaseous form scroll on Isabel, but apparently she's not considered an ally, and yeah, I get that. So we settle on getting another one of the fiends before throwing an invisibility pot on Isabel, who is instantly revealed by ourselves. Uh, I just... I don't even know what to say, Izzy. Gotta keep her alive somehow though, so we tell Marcus a silly little joke which has him rolling on the floor with laughter for the rest of the fight since our spell save DC is ridiculously high. Isabel almost does something useful when she turns the fiends, but she immediately undoes the effect by hitting one of them, causing it to turn around and paralyze her, which might honestly be good since it keeps her from getting into more trouble. Thankfully, the world's greatest bard is here to save the day, and with a couple good shots and a few good swings, all the demons upstairs get murked. A couple more rounds and all the ones downstairs get got too. All that's left is Marcus, who still can't get over that joke, and I mean, if you were there, you'd probably feel the same. It was, it was really great. To die for, some might say. And at long last, Isabel is safe, assuming she remains a lifelong fan after all that. Now, since Bartholomew has Salune's blessing, granting necrotic resistance, we're feeling ready to go free the Night Song. We pop open the door with the Umbral Gems, take the slow and spooky descent into the Shadowfell, and wake up in the world's most metal prison. At level 7 too, no less. With this level up, we get access to 4th level spells, for which we take Confusion to hopefully deal with larger crowds of enemies, since that's what we struggle with most. And we get a single 4th level spell slot to go with it. We also take the opportunity to swap out Plant Growth, which has been very disappointing, for Blindness, a spell that allows us to make enemies blind and isn't concentration. I cannot possibly overstate how important this spell is going to be, so keep an eye on it. And now we're going to go free the Night Song. We get to the bottom and meet the source of Catherick's immortality, a demigod who's the daughter of Salune who terribly misconstrues our noble intentions. We're just looking to create the sickest collab album in the nation, Bartholomew and the Harpers featuring the Night Song. She says she'd be happy to work with us for just a bit, but first she needs what everyone needs now and then. A warm touch from a friend. And just like that, Dame Aelin is freed and Moonrise is quaking in its boots as the Harpers who see her passing are inspired to action. Time to take out Ketherick once and for all. Bartholomew rallies alongside all six of our allies at the tower and the final battle of the bands breaks out after a short bit of dissing each other. That's right, it's Bartholomew and the Harpers versus Zarel and the Goons. 
This battle, as always, is pure chaos. We do our best to pick enemies off with our bow. Jahira plops down an impressively poorly placed ice storm before charging in, while Zarel CCs the rest of us. Jahira, for her efforts, gets taken out in the very first round, which has got to be some sort of record for a legendary hero. The rest of our allies do their best, but their best is not the most impressive. Thankfully, Zarel takes a break to bully her own underling for not keeping up the tempo. Regardless of how good our allies can shoot, they do a great job acting as living shields. I mean, look at them go. On our turn, we use confusion to try and disrupt the enemies, and we manage to get two of them caught up in it, Zarel included, before running outside and closing the doors. As we're thinking of what to do on our next turn, Quartermaster Tally has enough of waiting around and joins the fight as well. Her courage spurs us on, and we decide to cast Stinking Cloud, which weirdly enough only covers one side of the door, but at the very least causes some folks running through it to lose their actions. With the fight moving outside, we get ready to initiate our survival plan as we continue firing pot shots into the crowd of enemies, taking one out. Then we misty step up to a nearby balcony where most enemies won't be able to reach us. Next round, we get a beautiful cloud of daggers on a large group of enemies, shredding away at them. Unfortunately, our hero, Quartermaster Tally, succumbs to an Eldritch Blast from Zarel soon after. We manage to take out one of the cronies below, but now most of our enemies are awkwardly crowding behind the opposite side of the wall where we can't reach them, so we do something that could get Bartholomew cancelled. Not knowing what else to do, we summon Scratch on the other side of the cloud of daggers in the hopes it would lead enemies outside and into the cloud. Zrel, however, barely even moves and just blows him up with a shatter. Oh, this is getting brought up at my next therapy session. The fight turns into us raining down arrows into whatever foe decides to wander outside in the next few rounds, leaving just four enemies remaining afterwards, Zrel among them. With the help of a Featherfall Potion, we break the awkward ceasefire by jumping down and dashing towards the bridge. Then, the goons very thoughtfully run directly into the Cloud of Daggers and even stop inside of it, so we spend our next turn weakening them so the Cloud finishes them off when they start theirs again, which works on one of them and further weakens the rest. From here on out, it's just picking off the remaining enemies as they fail to reach us while we kite them towards the bridge till eventually even Zarel is dealt with. The Battle of the Band's victory goes to Bartholomew and the Ha... well, just Bartholomew now. Time to head inside and oh my god, there's still people in here, what the heck? We start a fight with them, summon a fan of rock music, get brutally electrocuted, almost kill ourselves via Guardian of Faith, Misty Step to Safety, turn invisible, watch our newest groupie crumble under the pressure, and heroically retreat. The warden remains ever vigilant, watching for our return, so we sneak up to her, get the drop on her, but somehow no one else, and start swinging away in an attempt to build up our spell save DC. Before the rest of the enemies catch up to us, we only manage to get two stacks of arcane acuity, but we bite the bullet, down a potion of speed, and pray for Thunderwave to work. And miracle of miracles, it actually does! Since the Warden was the only tough opponent out of the group, the rest of them go down a moment later. All that's left is dealing with this joke of a necromancer and her skeletons, and we're up to the roof. Awaiting us at the top is Papa Thorm himself, who's more than a little upset that we revoked his immortality. We do our best to intimidate him into surrendering, but unfortunately he's got nerves of steel. Dame Aelin shows up anyways to whoop Catherick's dusty booty and gives a rallying war cry before the fight breaks out proper. On our first turn, we use all of our bardic inspiration on Slashing Flourish after Slashing Flourish to take out the Necromancer in the center of the arena. And that's really the only threatening enemy that was here. The Necromites spend most of their turns missing us, or doing pretty negligible damage. All well, Catherick gets beat up pretty bad by Aelin as she starts off with a heavy crit. We make sure to thin down the horde so she can keep the beatdown going on Papa K uninterrupted. And for the most part, that's how the fight goes by, although Aelin really isn't a fan of the whole her doing a beatdown part since she much prefers to miss her attacks instead. Either way, just a couple turns later and a cloud of daggers causes Catherick to trigger his cutscene. And wouldn't you know it, Dame Aelin is just as bad in the cutscene as she is in the actual fight. Having been free for all of five minutes, she quickly gets slammed down and recaptured when Catherick teleports both her and himself to safety somewhere below the tower. The fight gets cleaned up, and we get ready to go plunging after them. Bartholomew jumps down a suspicious hole and lands in a Mind Flayer colony below, and it's in here that we find a room full of undead and fiends out the wazoo. 
Unfortunately for us, we need something on the other side of the room, so we pick a fight with them and get to it. We start off with a third level cloud of daggers on the Death Shepherd in the center, since this guy is the linchpin of the whole operation, with his ability to resurrect any of the other enemies that get killed, and even summon new ones. This does result in a rather insane dog pile being formed around us, but it's nothing a Misty Step can't solve, followed by a fourth level cloud of daggers right into the middle of all of them. If you can't tell, I really love this spell. We keep moving down the hallway and lure a bunch of them through the cloud of daggers, which is just so satisfying. Then, a thunder wave gets used to blast back some of the horde encroaching upon us. The Death Shepherd, by the way, is taking his sweet time getting over to us and mostly undoing our work along the way. Eventually, we get to this spot and we're able to buy some more time with a thunder wave to push enemies away and a cloud of daggers to get those who remain. Our concentration gets broken right after though and it's clear something's gotta give since this strategy isn't getting us anywhere. So on our next turn, we use a defensive flourish to boost our AC and a slashing flourish to trigger the elixir of bloodlust. And as we're looking for what to do next, we notice that Thunder Wave can blast enemies into this pit here where the Death Shepherd might not be able to reach them. And like that, a glimmer of hope is found. But we learn the hard way that hope is a fleeting thing when the Death Shepherd resurrects a winged horror that was flung off the cliff, which is just plain cheating if you ask me. To make matters worse, the zombies get a great round with a crit followed by a couple of hits that triggers our half-work feature and we're looking extra dire. Needing to make some big plays, we kill a zombie with our bonus action so we have two actions, slam down a couple of potions to heal up, and completely whiff a thunder wave. We run away a bit more and take a nasty crit in the process, and a winged horror also lands a hit on us taking us down to almost 0 HP. Regardless, we manage to make it to next round where we defensive flourish and pick off some more enemies to try and boost our odds of survival. And Bartholomew remembers that one really funny joke that took Marcus out of the fight, so we give it a whirl on the Death Shepherd, but he doesn't find it nearly as funny. Somehow, we manage to make it to the next round and try Tasha's hideous laughter again, and this time, it actually works. From here, with the eternal tide of enemies being resurrected, finally staunched, we can pick off the enemies one by one until it's just us and the Death Shepherd left. And we show him that pits do in fact mean that you're dead and gone with a thunder wave. Our reward for this fight is a puzzle, but Bartholomew is secretly giga-brained, so we solve it with ease. And our reward for the puzzle is a brain in a jar which once hooked up to a disembodied head we can speak to. After speaking to it, we're able to unlock the Gith Zerai Mind Barrier, a permanent buff that grants us advantage on intelligence saving throws for the rest of the run, which is going to be amazing in parts of Act 3 especially. At last, we descend to the depths of the colony where we find Kethric talking to Orin and Gortash, the other two big bads who, with the power of some super cool rocks, are able to control the Absolute herself, who we find out is a Nether Brain. Thankfully, they dip out, taking the Nether Brain with them, leaving Kethric chilling by himself with a Mind Flayer some necromites, some intellect devourers, as well as Aelin in the back corner being held captive. We fire off a shot to start the fight and, oh wait, sorry, never mind, catherick has got a monologue first. Okay, now the fight starts. On our first turn, we down an invisibility potion, scuttle over to where the Night Song is imprisoned, and free her yet again. The first phase of this fight really isn't too hard, with the exception of the Mind Flayer, so we take it out pretty early on and poke down some of the other goons here and there and shoot Catherick as he moves about awkwardly on the center platform until we send him into phase 2 where a literal god of death turns him into his avatar. Oh boy, phase 2. Phase 2 is a bit of a nightmare, with a bone chill aura that prevents Aelin from getting back up once she's knocked down, a beam that deals unavoidable damage and has a chance to frighten us, as well as a map-wide AoE that damages us and pulls us toward it should we fail a save. And to make matters worse, he can heal himself by eating his goons, which also unlocks the ability to cast Finger of Death, an insanely high damaging spell. This fight took absolute ages. We tried a bunch of different strategies, used different elixirs, tried different weapons, but we just kept dying. Until, right before I was about to give up and go back to an older save to grind out more levels, we decide to give it one more try. Before the fight, we make sure all of our buffs are in order. The main difference being that instead of an elixir of bloodlust, we're using heroism, which grants us 10 temp HP and an extra 1d4 added to all attacks and saving throws. We're also using the bow we picked up earlier, least expected, since it has a plus 2 modifier and a blinding shot, and we've already used Hunter's Mark from our other bow this long rest. 
And to top it off, we've got protection from evil and good to give all our enemies disadvantage on attacks against us, and we're immune to being frightened by them. We start off the fight and blaze through phase one, bursting down the Mind Flayer, and taking out Ketherick whose high AC matters less thanks to an added oil of accuracy granting us a plus two to hit with our bow. Then we throw down some haste spores to give us an extra action and try and blind Merkel whose legendary resistance doesn't work on the spell for some reason. Unfortunately, he saves regardless. To increase our damage a bit more, we coat our weapon in an oil of combustion at this point too, which causes fire explosions when we deal fire damage to this target. On his turn, he blasts us a little with the old fear ray, but we're immune to getting frightened thanks to the aforementioned protection spell, and our concentration gets a nice boost from our elixir. On our next turn, we finally land the blind, and this does a ton for us. It prevents Merkel from using the fear ray on us, gives us advantage on all our attacks, and to top it off, prevents him from consuming any of his goons, which means no healing and no finger of death. So we just spend the round shooting him down with every bit of damage we can muster, and maintaining the blindness with both our spell and the blinding shot, until he is nice and low. Whereupon we unload our last couple slashing flourishes that we had been saving, and with the help of a potion of speed, finally finish him off. And it definitely didn't take three whole hours. With him out of the way, we grab his shiny rock for our collection, reunite Isabel and Aelin and their duet in a touching moment, and at last move on to the road to Baldur's Gate, where the final spot of our tour awaits. Thank you all so much for watching. Here's some stats for this act. I hope you all enjoyed the second leg of Bartholomew's tour. I know I did. Stay tuned for Act 3. And if you want to show your support or catch it live, don't forget to like and subscribe, and feel free to join our Discord as well. There's a link in the description. A special thank you as well to our Storyteller tier members here on YouTube. Chess? and player five. Thank you all again, and I hope you have a really good day.